My name is David Copeland and I just graduated with my MFA from the Ulster University. And today I'm just going to give you a talk through my work and a bit of a walk through it too. Um, my project is called A Place to Sleep and A Place to Sleep started off as an exploration of my hometown. Uh, my hometown where I still live and have grown up all my life in. In the beginning it was nothing more than a documentary take on a small commuter town that it was situated astride an ever flowing river and the constant drone of the bypassing motorway that the A1 that is, drives past it. As in many other towns that sit on the edges of cities and the ends of motorways that connect their employees to their places of employment. The, the title of the project, A Place to Sleep, came out of a conversation that I was having with Ken at the time, just before I started my MFA, Ken Grant. Um, and it, I was talking at the time about the, this concept of a dormitory, dormitory town or commuter town and the suggestion that small towns have become uh, introverted and the idea that the people just use them for their basic needs, such as a place to, a place to eat, sleep and die, to be a wee bit morbid about the whole situation. Um, um, quotes like, that I found this by Chu Wee Fu, I think his name is pronounced. It's probably not, but we'll give that a go. Um, places or centers of felt value where biological needs are met, such as those for food, water, rest, and procreation are satisfied. But this, the project developed, as the project developed, this became not only a physical place, but a psychological place, a state of place, a state of place and a state of mind. Um, sleep might come to reference home, security and comfort, somewhere to lay our heads at the end of a busy day, um, but at the same time it can be morbid, rather to be put to sleep, rather maybe than to be fall asleep. Hopefully I'm not putting you to sleep, it's always a possibility. Um, my process, if you can call it that, happens, begins with a walk. Um, as do most of my projects, I tend to pick a camera up, usually for this one, initially my hometown, but most projects will is I work through by walking and seeing and make images. Initially photographing my hometown in a documentary context, making simple observations of the everyday, but like a street photographer, but without the brashness of the city or a need to capture some sort of decisive moment. Instead, I was creating quieter images that hope to evoke rather than provoke um, at the same time as referencing common lived experience, it was also referencing taught experience. For example, literary, literary influences such as Mark Twain's Tom Sawyer, a story of a, small, of a boy living in a small town, Riverside town, with ambitions beyond his own current existence. Including this quote in my final photo book, as I felt it spoke to the melancholy and the ideas and state of mind that I was trying to evoke in the viewer as they experienced the work. And even if the viewer can't relate to the work on a lived, through lived experience or personal, personal experiences, um, through taught experience, they can relate to the work through things like Mark Twain's quote, which I'll read out to you, which you probably can read yourselves, but anyway. He wandered far from the accustomed haunts of boys and sought desolate places that were in harmony with his spirit. A log raft in the river invited him and he seated himself on its outer edge, contemplating the dreary vastness of the stream, wishing all a while that he could only be drowned and all at once unconsciously without undergoing the routine and uncomfortable nature. Routine, the undergoing uncomfortable routine devised by nature. Um, including this quote in my final, as I suggested, I included it in my final photo book um, so that the viewer could relate or access to work through taught or lived experience. But even if you re remove from its original context of Tom Sawyer, it still evokes all those kind of emotions and ideas that I'm trying to talk about within the work. 
Um, as the project was developed, I ben began to consider how I was representing place and came to realize that my more objective approach wasn't working as it overlooked my position within the work and place. Therefore, I felt it, on I felt it necessary to employ visual and conceptual strategies that looked beyond the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker. It became more a story of place than a story of one particular place. Making images of abandoned remnants of childhood play, a uh, ball stuck in a tree, a crudely constructed raft in the river, a downed airplane, toy airplane, I don't know where it's a toy airplane or a, like a weather vane or something, I'm not sure, but it kind of evokes those ideas of childhood. Um, so the idea of the raft becomes an idea of its own, a mythology, a symbol, that it, not only through lived experience, but taught experience, it gives it meaning. And the same that it becomes a literary device and draws on those ideas of escape, survival, and making do, but with the fragility of childhood that we can all relate to. In recognizing their abandonment, I acknowledge a change in how we experience place and our position within the landscape and how it evolves, how it is felt and used in youth before it become aware of life, its agenda, demands, and they become the boundaries that are holding us in place. The mundane and the everyday reminds us that it's set in a reality and that it is relatable. The own people images from my series still explore humanity and they're not inhumane. As Adura Welty writes in the introduction of William Eccleston's book, The Democratic Forest, the human being, the perpetrator, the victim, or the abandoner of what we see before us is the reason why these photographs of place have their power and move to disturb us. They always let us know that the human being is the reason they were made. Welty suggests that the human being is the reason that William Eccleston's photographs were made, but it's also the reason why my images are made, and I would say probably most projects are made because of the human being. I'm hoping that the viewers are considering the perpetrator, the victim, and the abandoner, or possibly all three, or four if you consider the photographer, which being a bit biased, but I do. Um, not having not that I haven't included people in my images in, in the series, but when I do include people in the landscape, most of them tend to be figures consumed by their surroundings, isolation and darkness, shot from a distance usually, but there's always one exception that proves the rule, um, caught candidly and unaware of my presence. Whilst do, editing the sequence and putting the work together, together and making the selections, I've chosen to select images of males, young, old and middle-aged. The idea being that they become to be a reflection or represent the past, present or future self, as well as a timeline of the life cycle that is destined to repeat. I set about making images, although photographed in daylight, feel like night. The idea of turning day into night has its connotations that could be associated with sleep. I began to shoot in the evenings when the shadows were long and the light was difficult. And the darkness informs a psychological boundary that keeps me here and by default creates a visual boundary for the viewer. So it kind of keeps them in the space, but also in the context of the book, keeps them moving through it in search of something, maybe the light at the end of the tunnel or something along those lines or metaphors. Um, while in search of a point of view and not being economically, statistically or even geographically minded, as I know where I'm going, I just can't tell you how I'm getting there and how, that, and how you might, so don't ask. Um, <laughs> In my mind, my mind just doesn't retain that kind of information. Um, and you will have noticed that I haven't mentioned the place by name. And for those that are interested, it's called Jermore. It's about 20 minutes outside Belfast on a good day. Um, but not mentioning the name or pinning it on a map, 
I suggest the irrelevance of that information, as although the town provides the boundaries or the setting for the work, if only to provide an understandable and relatable construct for, that allows the viewer into the work. So we all know what a small town is and we can visualize that and have our own ideas of that. We might have our own experiences of a small town. It doesn't necessarily have to be my small town, but I'm allowing the viewer to bring their baggage to the work. Um, having moved away a couple of times, each time I find myself being drawn back um, by circumstances beyond my control and a need for a place to sleep has me again stuck in these all too familiar surroundings. I joke at times it's like a, you know the song Hotel California by the Eagles, you can check out any time you want but you can never leave. Um, um, all the images in the series have come Come, I've came across while walking, and this one was no different. Although it's slightly different to the images where the people are shot from a distance, it's still an image that I've came across, um, and the consumed, they're consumed by darkness, but it's obviously referencing sleep too, with the idea of the guy sleeping with his eyes closed. Um, and it also provides a, like a close pro uh, for the viewer the idea that I'm in close proximity of this too. It's not that I'm an outsider coming in to make the work. So that, that wee bit of closeness helps to pr put me in the work a wee bit more too. Identifying with the demands of place, each day I would circle its outer edge. And each day I would know that the end of today's walk was the beginning of tomorrow's. I never truly move forward and I begin to realize that the small town and many others like it have become a setting for this existence destined to repeat. While designing the book, I wanted to create a physical and psychological experience for the viewer. The pages unfold as you go through the work and in turn force the viewer to go back through the work in order to escape, bringing them back to where they started, referencing my process as when Working from home, I would always start and finish the shoot in the same place. In this, I'm creating an intentional issue for the viewer and referencing my process to evoke the psychological. So the idea of creating kind, some kind of thing where it, it forces the viewer to like think about it and then they have to go back through it again. It, I, they start where they finish and they finish where they start. Or, so I create this staggered sequence from left to right and middle, printed on full blade so the book replicates a, a rhythm of the walk as you go through it. Referencing my process, it repeats almost like a 12 bar blues walking. And the project is probably made to the soundtrack of B.B. King's Live at the Regal or Bob Dylan or a lot of Tom Petty um, and the Heartbreakers. Maybe their small town experiences shaped seep through my ears and shape some of my own ideas. The sequence begins and ends with referencing the, the home and using the classic apex shape of the house. Um, at this point, I'm just gonna play you through the, a video of my dummy book um, that if there's any publishers watching, hello. Um, so feel free to have a look through this. I'll talk a wee bit, but I don't want to talk too much over it, not that there's any sound. Um, so, as you'll see the book, the casing of the book closes on both ends, so if it was sitting on a bookshelf, bookshelf, it would look exactly the same. Also has these three panels that kind of create a boundary in itself. So I'm constantly, constantly thinking of the viewer's experience and how I could use conceptual methods and physical methods to try and evoke something in the viewer when they see the work. The pages, the images will repeat too. So that idea of like almost like the 12 bar blues things where something repeats, you get repeated images um, so that they live on their own, but also can live beside other images, which might change how you read read the work too. And then, as you'll see in the video here, to get out of the book and to close it, 
and forcing the viewer to fold their way back through it, unless they're really lazy and just close it and be really annoying. You're not supposed to do that, it's not allowed. <laughs> um, so yeah, this kind of experience where it becomes slightly awkward too is all part of that trying to evoke something in the viewer. It might really annoy them and they might never read it again, but if it's there to help provoke those kind of ideas. And you can see even the making of this video is quite awkward to put back together, but hopefully when that publisher that's watching is going to publish it, it'll make it a wee bit more ergonomic. <laughs> and then you'll see, and you end right where you finished. Or right where you started even. And there we go. And it's not going to let me skip. Oh, and I'll just leave you with this quote, which kind of finishes the passage of the original Tom Sawyer quote. At last he rose, sang, and departed into the darkness. And there we go. Um, got 15 minutes and 40 seconds. I don't know if that's about right, but there we go. Thanks for listening. There we go. Any questions, if anybody wants to know anything? Yeah? You talked a little bit about the difference between provoke and evoke mm -hmm. here in kind of the intention for the viewer. Mm -hmm. I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about that and then maybe what the intended so, experience is with the viewer. You sort of talked about like the book being maybe annoying. Yeah, so the idea of evoke and provoke. So I say provoke is probably a bit more someone being pushed whereas the idea of evoke is probably more I want them to feel something of their, of their own too or something a bit more emotional. It's not that they become like I'm like trying to shove something down their throat or make, make a big statement about something in particular. It's about creating an experience for the viewer too. And that idea of annoying them is not so much that I want the book to be totally annoying. It's just that it, it Evokes something psychological, and that is kind of forcing them to consider the ideas, and also totally referencing my process and the idea of the flipping pages, and that idea of re replicating the rhythm of a walk as you go through it. So what I'm trying to do is put them in my shoes, but also make them consider their own experiences at the same time. I don't know if that answered your question. But Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And I love the subject matter, David. I think it's uh, very poignant. And I think, I guess, each artist can't raise this question, but what's next? You know, what's next for this work? It's a beautiful produced book that you made, mm -hmm. but are you thinking of exploring this kind of um, IO your methodology towards other small towns and other small villages um, and other people's complexities with that mm -hmm. and their own struggles? Or how do you see this progressing further? In that res res sense, the idea of not actually pinning it down to any particular town or that idea of removing the name of the town itself or placing it on a map, I think it kind of remo removes almost that ab attentional ability to go, if I visit every small town on the way to Belfast and make a piece of work, it's just going to be me doing the same thing in a slightly different place um, over and over again, which is not kind of the intention of the work. So my small town is everybody's small town. Um, the idea of new work and making new work. Um, I have a few ideas. They're still to do with place. They're, um, I have maybe something to do a wee bit more with music or lyrics that I find that kind of reference this idea of uh, place. Um, uh, what's the quote? Um, there's a Willie Nelson song of all songs that has got a quote. Yeah, it was looking for America in a Western movie. And it kind of interested me because it made me think of spaghetti westerns and the idea that they were all shot in Spain. And this idea of America too, that um, I love American music. Um, I kind of 
love all that. So I actually love old spaghetti westerns too, the way they're shot and the way they're filmed. And then this perceived idea of what a place is, that we've seen America through the film and TV and there's like how it's actually perceived or it, it, how it actually is, which I don't know myself. So it wouldn't be about going to America to make a piece of work. It would be about finding America that isn't, that isn't real essentially, or finding the fake America, not in America and referencing that, but like, that's only a rough idea that's floating about my head. Whether that goes anywhere or not, who knows? It's just kind of early stages. But yeah, um, I'm also on the Futures program here for things that I'm doing in the future. I'm in the Futures program here at Belfast Exposed. Um, um, our group, our MFA group, are starting up a collective called Anthropic 11. 11, yeah, but it's wrote in Roman numerals and I'm incredibly dyslexic, so they don't help me. It's like numbers and words are bad, but when you've mixed the two of them together, whew, um, it's a bit like algebra. That wasn't a good idea. Um, so yeah, so we're, I'm working on different things. Um, so yeah, thanks, Ben. Yeah. Um, from just more a point of view, really, is something your grip could be used for just have somebody something, you know, so you just say to somebody like, so you have 10 people, and you say, go into this room, close the door, and look at this book. And it would basically test people's patience. <laughs> <laughs> and you have different areas of receptivity because, you know, it's dark, mm -hmm. and some people would see it that way, but the, as you said, they would look but I just, when I heard you were talking about, you know, being annoying, I was just kind of immediately saw that psychology test in my mind. Mm -hmm. You know, to test people. Yeah, it's like, I created my own ink, ink block test, like a yeah, uh, raw, raw shock test. Yeah, yeah I kind of, yeah, I kind of love that because it's, I've always kind of loved that. And the idea, I actually done research not that long ago about the raw shock test. And it's, it doesn't work because the person who's answering the questions is influencing the viewer. Mm -hmm. So that, but I love that idea that you would, it would provoke something and then you could do a psychological thing on it. So the idea that it become a psych psychological experiment is kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. So yeah, cool, thanks. All good? No more questions? That's great. Thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs>